the, the problem is with anything in behavior change, it's really, really hard to do unless, you know, the circumstances are right, there's motivation and, and there's opportunity. So um, we know from meta-analysis, so this is when a lot of data from trials get pulled and we come up with some sort of average um, understanding of how well um, weight loss studies work and how well weight loss interventions work when they're being trialed in research. And we know that the average around over 12 months is maybe only 2.8 kilograms. So that's not really a lot. Um, there are trials that are quite encouraging. So where people have lost about 4.5 kilos, 4.4, sorry, at 12 weeks even. So at the three month mark, and, and that's great. If they can keep it going, the problem is people usually, um, they regain weight when they leave an intervention within sort of um, six to 24 months, they're usually back to where they were when they started. And one of the, um, the better performing programs, interestingly, was um, actually the um, RAP study, and they looked at Weight Watchers, and they looked at Weight Watchers intensive support, Weight Watchers normal support, and I think they had another group, another control group that was, I think, just information advice. But the, um, the 12 months of, um, of heavy Weight Watchers support um, actually came up with a result that showed about 6.8 kilograms of reduction. Now that's, that's good, you know, and that is very similar, just to keep this figure in mind, this is actually a similar figure to what we achieved with functional imagery training in the weight loss trial. But as you will see, we achieved that with four hours of support by phone um, and in person. So we had a mix, I'll, I'll show you later as well. Um, so we achieved that in four hours over six months. And then by six months, they um, were still losing weight. And by 12 months, they were still losing weight, um, the people in the fit group. So, but I, I'll get there later. Um, the next slide, we, we've sort of, we thought, we know that in order, <laughs> To, to get going, to, to, to you know, energize the behavior or um, get it off the ground. You know, you need to be confident. And like I said, you need to have the capability to do it, but also motivation seems to be a big, big driver. And we really wanted to be sure before we designed function imagery training, we needed to be sure that um, people from the public that were either um, maintaining weight loss or wanting to lose weight, um, that they actually felt that we were on the right track. And we literally just asked them one question. We asked them, what is the hardest thing about losing weight or keeping weight off that you've lost? And they all sat in the focus groups. I think there's six focus groups, um, the references at the bottom for the paper that we published. They all sat that motivation was the key issue. So that actually to get started, if you're motivated, it's easy, but then to keep it going, especially during periods of slow progress and um, when things get a little tough and challenges are there to overcome. And they interestingly didn't mention that information giving and having a prescribed diet or whatever was that important to them. Um, they, they knew the information was out there um, that they had a lot to choose from. And um, if anything, they thought, well, you know, it's belittling because we already know that eating an entire chocolate cake isn't good for us, but you know, if, if we feel the binge coming on or emotional eating episode or whatever you whatever you want to call it, it's really hard to resist that and to just you know stick to your guns and know this is bad for me. So information giving and sort of prescriptive diets weren't really the thing that they wanted or having those better tailored to their personal needs. No, it was actually motivation that they wanted. Support in. So. I'm jumping ahead in my rambling, sorry. So many programs and many public health campaigns, as you probably know, do focus on motivation, um, on information giving and advice giving. And they, uh, many programs are quite prescriptive in their advice giving. I know that the things out like the Noom app and stuff that have a little bit of um, sort of coaching elements as well. But really, at the end of the day, they're using, the, you know, they still want you to stick to a certain regime. They want you to stick to a certain diet. And um, there, there's a program, the Jenny Craig program, for example, which is quite interesting. They um, deliver motivational support. It's very expensive, but they deliver motivational support up to seven years, I think, of um, people signing up. 
and and they have really good results over the past years they they published some studies and, and they've been really really good um but again the the element of motivation is really important so we need to motivate people to act on advice, to act on, on what's out there. Functional imagery training does that. So you can use functional imagery training alongside another therapy, a, a counseling. You can use it um, to, to get somebody to make the most of their coaching sessions or to, um, to help them stick to their goal of going to Weight Watchers every week or to help them to stick to their goal to using their you know, meal tailoring program or whatever they've chosen. Or you can use functional imagery training to support someone to actually just get on with sort of habit changing goals, things that they have identified at the beginning that, that, that there are their problem and that they knew already and that they're working on on their own and, and just using the imagery to motivate themselves to get going with those things. And we know that motivation predicts long term weight loss. So people that are highly motivated are likely to keep weight off. Um, self-determination, so another type of motivation here, internal, new, um, internal motivation, um, as well as sort of um, motivation for being physically active can really help um, regulating food intake and to be physically active. Um, in, it's a good predictor in, in lots of weight loss studies for those people that have done really well. And it really does predict engagement um, with things like very low calorie diets or the shake diets or the soup diets that are coming out that are people that MDs are prescribing to get people to lose weight rapidly um, for um, things like treatment of type 2 diabetes because we know, we know they need to lose weight and we know that if they you lose it rapidly for a while then that's medically excellent but it's also really good for their motivation so it's it's a um i'd like to reinforce this very much and um, we as behavior change scientists like people to um pick small goals and in fit you start with one or two goals at the beginning as well and, and to work step by step through them and that's absolutely fine as long as they're they're, they're goals that will um gain results you know, and you can talk to them about whether they want to gain results in their confidence first to see if they can actually make a little change first or if they, if they want to see big results. The thing with big results is if people want to um, pick something that is um, maybe an extremely low calorie diet, that's absolutely fine. It is very motivating to shed weight fast. But then we still need to get them thinking using imagery or motivation interview and combination like in fit about making a lifestyle change for good, about having a mindset change. And like that's really what functional imaging training achieves. It achieves a mindset change. So it's not about just sticking to that low calorie diet, maybe for six weeks before surgery, because you need to shed the weight and then you can have your surgery and then you know, regain because you haven't learned how to adapt and how to, to keep this going and mentally you're not there yet. So that's what functional imaging training does, but yeah. So I just wanted to throw that out there. <laughs> I'd better hurry, you've only got an hour. So functional imagery training here is just a slide that sums up the things that are addressed in one session of functional imagery training. And then you may address elements of that in, 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 in other sessions. And you may work with somebody for a, um, a short amount of time and until, until they're confident using this on their own. Or you may work with someone who's much more complex, maybe they have um, and alcohol dependency alongside obesity and maybe um, have severe depression as well. And you can tailor the intervention to be a longer support system then and to, yeah, so um, just adapt it in a way that suits your, your clients, your patients. So what we would do is typically we would strengthen imagery of an ideal self and future goal. Sorry, that's the phone, I'm not getting that. Um, while contrasting it with imagery of the current state. And what we mean by that is really, this is a very important milestone at the beginning of the intervention. We really try to get them to imagine one downside of how things are now and to firmly root themselves in reality that has to be quite uncomfortable. And then we ask them to imagine how this would be if things don't change. And um, that can be very upsetting for them. And it's obviously not a very nice place to be. So we, we, we just sort of, um, take a snapshot of that and then move them on to how things may be in the future. So when they have actually made a change, however, but however they've done it isn't important at the stage. It's just important that they can imagine what life might be like if things are getting a little bit better already. And then we get them to imagine that future self of them that where they are at their best. 
And that increases desire for, for change. It increases desire for them to, to bridge that big gulf between where they want to be and where they are now. And um, it motivates them to really go for that. And it can also prompt them to think about specific goals and how to get there already. Maybe they've done something in the past and, and they can work in. And we develop imagery of steps towards that ideal self that when they're at their best, that goal, and we practice that. So we practice goal-directed behaviors. What do they need to put in place? The first step, how they're going to get there? How does it feel as they're doing that, et cetera? And then we develop, um, you know, we focus on proximal positive benefits as well. So as they're working through their steps, you know, how good does it feel already? Sorry, I never know where to look there or there. Um, so um, how good will it feel already to, to, to be working towards something um, that, that is good for them, that is addressing their behavioral problems, that is going to help them to get closer to this ideal self. Um, so, but what, what might change quite quickly? So if I am going for a walk every day for a week only, how will I feel at the end of this week? Or how may I even feel at the end of my first walk? I might be puffed out and my legs might be aching a little bit and my back may be hurting, but what other things are there that are positive? Oh, maybe I've seen a really lovely bird sitting on a fence or in a tree, or I've seen you know, the waves crashing onto the shore, even though it's winter and I'm wrapped up warm, but I'm appreciating sort of things that I see, or I feel like I've used my body and how good does that feel? How does that feel after a week? So, so really uh, getting them to focus on proximal changes on little steps along the way that will keep them keen, you know, so to keep the motivation going and to see things are actually changing and they're changing pretty fast, if I'm honest. So, yeah, so get them to learn to appreciate that and get them to learn to practice those moments and imagery to keep them going. And then we encourage imagery um, of overcoming obstacles, things that may get in the way quite, quite quickly um, and using strategies that have worked before. So we'd ask them to imagine a past success, for example, it doesn't have to be weight loss, it can be anything, um, you know, passing their driving test or whatever, what tricks and tips can they think of to give to themselves now? What, what techniques may they use now um, to help them to, to overcome little obstacles that might creep, um, might creep up. And is there anybody else that can help them, you know? What emergency techniques could we put into place? Um, and then imagine using some of those. And that really increases their self-efficacy. And by that, what we mean is sort of confidence, but it's more like the confidence that they are capable of achieving something to a certain standard for themselves. Okay, so we really want to build that confidence. And then we just train them how to remember doing the imagery and when to best do it and to try out a little bit that so that they can actually practice it every day. And that just, you know, helps them in the moment when things, um, you know, we have things like the cravings buster, which I teach in training and adaptations of, which is really a direct demonstration of how imagery in the moment can buy them some extra time and stop them in their tracks and actually give them that that other focus of when they are just about to go to the fridge maybe and, and indulge in more food. So just um, teaching imagery as a um, self-regulatory process and as something they do daily. And then with time, it will become easier. It will become more automatic. So, you know, they might not do this forever to this extent because they you're training them in thinking that way and in using that. And it becomes just less effortful and much more automatic. So for the functional imagery training um, versus motivational interviewing trial, the big weight loss trial we published in the International Journal of Obesity, um, we recruited 141 members of the um, Plymouth public of, in, in England here um, that were overweight um, or obese. And um, we collected um, weight loss data at baseline and we then randomized them out of those 141, we could randomize 121. The other ones were just, you know, they dropped off because they thought it was just gonna be a very short intervention about exercise and they didn't read the information properly. So um, we're not worried about those. And then we gave them the intervention for six months and then we left them unsupported for six months. And when I say we gave them fit for six months, really only four hours over six months. The first session I did face-to-face -face with people because we had to weigh them as well. And then I phoned them. So um, then they had unsupported six months, so no intervention, no contact with me. And then we weighed them again at 12 months and met with them, saw how they were doing. 
And um, yeah, we retained uh, 114 people out of 121. So that's really great because normally you have at least a third of people drop out of weight loss. So they really like it. Um, this is just there so you get an idea. Don't worry about the stats here. It's just giving you an idea of how many guys we had, how many ladies and the age range. If you want to look at that, the BMI range. I think one thing that's quite interesting here, if you look at the BMI range, they were not that massive. I mean, we had people that were big, but really um, the median and the mean here, very similar. So um, BMI just over 30. So they're just cutting that obesity category. If we had included only higher BMI people, we would have had even more impressive results because they would have had more to lose. But we thought we would include everybody and just want to see as an intervention, how well does this work and not you know, compete over how much, um, how much weight loss we can actually highlight in the journal. So just like we just wanted to get an idea of how much of an effect can I expect from this intervention in the general public? And we had people who um, who had not read the information, so the only exclusion criteria really were having an eating disorder or pregnancy. And we had a lot of people who actually had binge eating disorder but didn't declare it, and people who had um, had had real um, um, sort of issues like um, depressive symptoms and. Um, were on, on antidepressants that may actually affect weight gain as well, but they did incredibly well and they benefited. So um, this is how we set it up, just in case you want to get an idea. And I would really recommend selling functional imagery training as a package once you've trained in it, if you want to train in it, or even just use this as a basis here, what I've told you to use mental imagery in your interventions and weave it in um, without doing the training, that's up to you. Um, so they, um, they had a face-to-face -face session, 60 minutes with me um, at the university in a really comfy counselling room. And then they had um, the following week, they had a phone call of about 35 minutes on average. And then they had um, fortnightly booster calls, so five to 15 minutes. And 15 minutes, you can do quite a lot of personalised imagery around if they're hitting road, you know, roadblocks and they need to re refresh. So, so that's really good. And then we had monthly booster calls after um, 12 weeks. So and week 13, we started the monthly booster calls. And that's quite good because by then they, they really know what they're doing and they just kind of need someone to check in, you know, that, that still cares. So, so that worked really, really well. And um, so uh, both interventions, I've, I've given both interventions. Um, so functional imagery training group and a motivational interviewing group. And, um, but I was rated by someone outside of our team who doesn't normally work with us. And they gave me high marks for both interventions. So it's not like I pooped out on the MI people. I only did the fit people really well. Um, so, and, and the other interesting thing is we got these wonderful results, but we gave no dietary and exercise advice and um, we didn't prescribe any information to, to either group in, in a sort of a way that they had to act or what have you. Um, we achieved excellent results, as you can see. So the blue line are the MI people, the orange line are the fit people. So fit mean weight loss was about six kilograms and then MI about 1.8 kilograms, I think nearly two kilograms. And um, so what we're seeing here is really that the fit people um, did a lot better. Um, so 41 of 59 um, people in the fit group um, lost 5% or more of that body weight. So really important. And 27 lost 10% um, or more. So just remember that we really want to get over that 5% mark or at least 5% to feel, the, um, to feel uh, but also to be able to measure real medical um, successes. So one lady in the weight loss trial, for example, um, she uh, reverted her stage two liver disease back to zero. So she completely, she lost so much weight, she completely reversed her liver disease. So, so that's really, really amazing. And there are other examples of health examples, but it's, uh, I, I think I, I need to, um, I need to press on here because we only have so much time. Um, so you can see the performance here. And if you're thinking about how effective an intervention is, then it might be helpful to think about the mean difference, which is five kilograms. So really um, five times better um, in terms of effect size as the fit intervention did, the motivation interviewing. And motivation interviewing is one of the gold standards in treating addiction. Um, I shouldn't say addiction, I usually say dependency nowadays. There's sort of like a negative connotation attached to addiction, but um, 
So dependency treatment, uh, be that food or weight or, or actually adhering to um, a, a prescribed medicine regime or whatever. Um, motivation interviewing has 1500 published trials, you know, that show that it really works. Um, we did this for practitioners or for MDs or whatever, um, psychologists, you know, who are also practitioners. So um, this is just a pictorial um, diagram which shows you and shows your clients or your patients, look, you can have motivational interviewing, which is really, really good intervention or, you know, another talk therapy here, but this is um, compared to motivational interviewing. Um, so just imagine we took 100 people and we gave them motivational interviewing or functional imagery training. These are the results that we can reasonably expect. So if we look at fit here, so in fit, we can expect, you know, one, two, three, four, five. So we can expect so and so many people here in dark green to lose 15% of weight. Um, we can expect no gain in fit. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, we can expect um, losses of five to 10% of body weight here in the other green colors. And then we've got gain here. Actually, we can expect a tiny little gain, two people out of a hundred um, to gain. So these are the, the squares represent the people and the colors represent the gain or the losses. And then there's a direct comparison here. So if you want to choose an intervention and you can show your patients, you know, this is my evidence, what do you think you want? So functional imagery training does show promise in weight loss, um, but do we know how motivational interventions are perceived by participants? And that's really important. So if they don't like it, they're not going to engage with it. And, you know, you can have the best intervention in the world, but what is the point of rolling it out and throwing money at it if, if people are going to drop out or if they're not going to pull through or if they're not using it and you don't get a clear idea of whether it works or not because they don't like it. So um, the experiences of fit uh, participants from the randomized controlled trial who completed six months of the intervention phase. Um, they were explored um, with um, open-ended questions in an in, in a, um, anonymous questionnaire. I, I didn't want to interview them because I didn't want them to feel they had to tell me that it was great. I wanted them to be able to express their views, you know, untainted, unbiased. Um, so we asked about their experiences and we asked them to compare to current weight loss attempts, um, previous weight loss attempts, and we asked them to, um, to think about the improvements that they had made and also to think about any improvements that they made outside of weight loss, um, any behaviors they changed, any, any gains they've gotten. And then we thematically, and I use um, something called organic thematic analysis by Braun and Clark, um, I, um, I analyzed the data. And what we saw, and we did this for both groups, so MI and functional imagery training. So the only identifier was which group they were in. I didn't know who said what, I just knew which group they were in. Um, so the majority of participants in both groups felt really motivated. They felt much better supported than in previous attempts to lose weight. And they felt really good about having, you know, having been able to have the freedom to choose their own goals, not having been prescribed to. And they all, all of them mentioned improvements under weight loss. But, a need for continued therapist support or coaching support. I don't like to think of it as a therapy. I don't know why I say a therapist. It's more like a training, like I said. And fear of lapsing into old habits or of relapse were only expressed by those in the MI group. So they just needed a little bit longer to get going and they wanted a little bit more support. And the imagery, if you think about it, is just like the supercharging element that, you know, puts MI on steroids, basically. You know, mental imagery is so much more emotive than verbal types of thinking. So you get a real rehearsal of how things could be. And this emotional boost really, you know, that's picking you up and making you want to go. And um, functional imagery training participants were really confident that changes could be maintained. So without the ongoing support. And like I said earlier, this is not a word I invented. This comes from straight from our participants they really felt like this was a mindset change. Like this was for life. They weren't bothered for about it. They were enjoying the imagery. So they didn't mind doing the intervention and doing the intervention was clearly critical to achieving good results. Okay, so really great results. So um, I've already said that people felt more uh, motivated and more supported even though I didn't give them any lifestyle advice. Um, importantly, those receiving fit were confident that they could sustain weight loss. 
Um, but even if things were going wrong, so they said things like, oh, if I fall off the wagon, I'll just get back up and, you know, keep going. I just have to, you know, tweak my imagery and everything will be fine. I can work through this obstacle. And then functional imagery training and participants applied it to other areas of their life. So that was really, really interesting for us. So, um, and they mentioned a lot about using it to um, get back to work after being off with work-related stress or anxiety. Um, I had a, um, a student nurse in the trial that was very anxious, used to, to help her get back out of the house after having suffered trauma at work. And um, the um, craving spasm that I mentioned earlier um, was really extremely helpful um, in easing the urges to binge um, for those individuals that had actually at the beginning not declared that they had a binge eating disorder. So that was really nice. So they're really clinical results at addressing one of the key issues in bulimia without purging and in binge eating order, a disorder. Um, I'd like to say that I'm talking a lot about the research results here um, because I can illustrate them to you. Um, I want to say as well, anecdotally practice-based evidence, my clients, of which I have few, but very complex ones. Um, I might see more than four hours for than four hours of functional imagery training, but I have clients that are, you know, um, recovering from three different eating disorders at the moment. They're doing really well. And anecdotally, I can tell you that this works very well with people with complexities. They may just need a little bit longer to get used to doing the imagery and there may be cognitive deficits that need to be addressed like in depression, et cetera. So really important um, to just go a bit slower at the beginning and make sure they really, really get it. Um, so provision of episodic imagery. So that means personalized imagery through functional imagery training provides a highly acceptable, lasting and adaptable motivational intervention. And I will leave you here with some of the wonderful quotes from the pilot we did, the pilot trial and the, the randomized controlled weight loss trial. And I will share this with you and by Grace and um, by email as well today so that you can have this PowerPoint just to refer back to for your own interest. So um, really wonderful quotes here. Like I said, really extending functional imagery training um, creatively to other areas. So I was off with work stress, um, one participant says, but imagining my first day back eased my worry about the day. I rehearsed it and even turned out better than I imagined. And um, really nice here, the, the positive reinforcement of the imagery, it really makes me feel good about being in this for the long haul. And I enjoy the path, I'm not deprived like when I was on all these other diets before. So they're not deprived which is um, so important. And um, yeah, so I thank you for listening to me. Um, if you want more information about FIT, um, I have a massive thesis that is publicly available and loads of papers and stuff so I can send you and um, things outside of the, the training materials as well that I'm totally happy for you to have a look at and work through. Um, if you have any questions or you want to train eventually, um, just uh, write me an email